as we were uh, discussing the Knights nice Templars and the Crusaders and the trips that they were doing to the East and all the changes, and then the Knights nice Templars to be, um, uh, well, I would say very badly treated by the King of France and the new Pope that the King France was appointed, and many of them managed to escape to Scotland. And we know that later, uh, Freemasonry for, um, became kind of public again on the eye and, and Scotland. So what is the connection? And that's why people wanted to know about Freemasonry. Right, um, Freemasonry, and what is the story? Is Freemasonry a secret society or a society with secrets? And I would say that there was a time that yes, Freemasonry had to be a secret society, but from 1717, uh, Freemasonry is a society with certain secrets and most definitely not a secret society anymore. So, but what is uh, Freemasonry all about it? Well, for the moment we're we'll start talking about Masonry, that later will be Freemasonry. Um, we know that only um, in the year 1390, it is the first, the first, um, shall we say, manuscript, the first written mention that we have of masonry in the con in, in Europe. And uh, but that doesn't mean that it didn't exist before or didn't exist afterwards because it was secret. There are many things that we don't know where they are, and other things were destroyed or burned at different times. So we know that we got one written record for 1390. And, and that um, document, uh, there is a brief introduction setting that the craft of Freemasonry began with Euclid in Egypt. He was the great father of geometry. And from him to the children of Israel, that's what the document says, while they were in Egypt, and the great Pythagoras, and so on through an elaborate path to King Altestan in 900 in England. This myth formed the base of the constitution that you're going to see much later on. We don't say it's necessarily true, but that is what we have written about it, what we, what we can find in our research. But the truth is that masonry was much, much older, and it goes back to biblical times. And remember uh, um, that uh, we were talking about these knights, these night, this knights who went to the Holy Land, and they spent nine years excavating under King Solomon Temple. We don't know what they found, but we know that they came back to Europe with a lot of, of things and definitely with a lot of knowledge and they were going then to create themselves into the Knights Templars. What did they bring? We know that by the time they, uh, we don't know if they brought the Ark of the Covenant, we don't know if they brought a lot of treasure, but we definitely know that they brought a lot of knowledge and a lot of building knowledge, a lot of geometry, because once, once they were back, suddenly it was this explosion of new techniques and new understanding, and the great cathedrals built by the Templars started sprouting everything in Europe. So we know that uh, the nice Templars brought that knowledge back, that it was somehow lost or forgotten in Europe. So um, the Masons, uh, um, were in reality the great, great art architect of the past. They had a knowledge that very, very few people know. They have their new mathematics and, and their new geometry, right? They were come, ar architects come engineers and knowledge that very, very few people had at that time, right? So that knowledge was terribly precious and the great uh, Masons of the time were terribly important in their society. So if we go back to the Egyptian times, we see that the, especially you know the Egyptians with their continuous construction of the of the pyramids, which they are perfect. We know that they have um, a, a, a windows that will just align perfectly at a certain time with an angle in the sun and the stars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that requires ma major, major knowledge. The interesting thing is that uh, when we uh, found when the pyramids and the tombs were open in the 19th and 20th century, they have found 
the signs of Freemasonry uh, that go back to about 3,000 years. You can see on the picture on the side, uh, the, probably the master mason, the architect, the builder of that time, got the arm right and the square, which is one of the signs that is still used now by Freemasons in the ceremony. I put uh, some red marks there. To he, he's standing on the plum, which is also one of the signs of Freemasonry, and he got the two feet on the square because Freemason are supposed to act on the square. Now, that is thousands of years ago, and you can't say that Freemasons of the 15, 16, 1700 copied that from them because these tombs were only open about 100, 150 years ago. Right, you can see the apron, the apron of the old Masons of Egypt with the triangle, which is the symbol. And there is a small apron there in the south, which is the today's um, the, the apron that the Masons use today with a triangle on top of that. So it's quite clear that Masons as a society, as a very, very important society, had definitely existed from the time of the pharaohs. So um, just let's talk a little bit of what a medieval master Mason was and the European tradition. A medieval master mason had to undergo what passed for a very liberal education in those days. For instance, in England, he would leave home at nine or 10 years of age, already literate in English and French and educated at home. Literate at a time when in Europe, very few people were literate. So a Freemason had to first be literate. From then, until the age of 14, he will go to a monastery to learn Latin. Between the ages of 14 and 17, he would learn the basic skills of choosing, shaping, and combining a stone. And then between the ages of 17 and 21, he would be required to learn by rote a large number of formula or formal problems in geometry. Three years as a journeyman would often finish with a submission of a master work, which would be the equivalent of a, a thesis that you do now in university, dealing with the set problems and construction and design. And only after that, his career will start. So we're talking that, especially for the times, a master mason was tremendously cultural. He had different languages, he had Latin, he had geometry, mathematics, could read and write, he had experience. He was a very, very valuable individual. Of course, that knowledge was specialized and they kept it within the guild, they keep it within their groups. Um, Knowledge in those days was very rare. The church, we had more of the knowledge. It was very uh, possessive about it. And knowledge, uh, even now we know knowledge costs money. It's important. I mean, anybody who has to send their children to school or university know how expensive mm -hmm. knowledge is. And not only that, I mean, we all know about industrial espionage and all that. So even today in the 21st century with Google and, and free libraries and, and all that, they still Certain knowledge is very precious, and it was much more precious than that. So we got this individual, the master mason, who had all this knowledge, but it was something else. Um, as I say, Freemason grew from the stone masons of the Middle Ages. These were the men building cathedrals and other big buildings all over the lands. What that means, the Freemason had the capacity to move from one place to another. There was a time when the serfs belonged to the land. Whoever lived in a village belonged to the feudal lord. People didn't have the freedom to move and go wherever they wanted, but the Masons did have. And that's why they started to be called free Masons. We were the only ones who had the power of association, create their close girls, go wherever they wanted. So that made the societies of Freemasons tremendously powerful, and a lot of people want to belong to them. But these individuals were. Um, Obviously, they have all the knowledge of building and all that. But like everything, people with knowledge and with languages will want to have knowledge in many other subjects, you know. And especially when we come into the Renaissance and later the Illumination, uh, they will be interested in many other things before building and mathematics and geometry. Remember the world, it was exploding, studying the old knowledge, discovering new things. Um, so the investigation and research went beyond architecture and expanded into astronomy, cosmology, and eventually all the new sciences. 
would put them in direct conflict with the established church, who meant to control all research and bring the fount of all knowledge. The earth was flat. You, you say something else, you went, you went to a stake. Um, Galileo said that the earth was not the center of the universe, but just one more little planet going around the sun. And there he was. In fact, he was tortured and he was in prison for so many years. Eventually, he had to recant, go against all his scientific knowledge because he just couldn't uh, support the, the torture anymore. But that's the way it was. The church said something, and that's the way it was moving, you know, whatever you wanted. So already we find that the Masons start getting into conflict with the powers that be. And that brings us to the conflict that we know had happened earlier on with the Templars, who also were individual in a way and were doing their own thing. Uh, there is much uh, speculation about are the Templars um, successors or, um, um, sorry, are the um, Freemason successors of the Templars? Well, not quite. Uh, if you think about it, the Templars were an association that were created for a purpose at a time, to protect the pilgrims going to the Middle East, in, um, to, to Jerusalem. Then they started creating a banking system to provide it with it so they could transport the money, et cetera, et cetera. But they had that purpose. And we know that uh, that purpose came to an end. But the interesting thing is that there were Freemasons probably within those Templars, you know. And when the job or the purpose of Templar finished, they still were Freemasons. And so, of course, uh, after suffering the persecution, Freemasonry it kept staying underground. So uh, it's more like, it's quite likely that it's not that the Freemasons developed from the Templars, but that they were Freemasons already. And because of the character of the association, they became Templars to serve a purpose, but never stopped being Freemason. As we know, Freemason is much, much older than the Templars. So um, we know that at the time, um, the world was changing. There were uh, more freedom. People started to be able to move more around. We had the the bourgeoisie, the business class that started to develop, uh, used to say, with the rise of capitalism and the market economy the 16th and 17th centuries, the old deal system broke down. But the Masonic lodges survived. Why? Because in order to boost the membership and raise funds, the Stone Mason bills started to recruit non-Masons, people who also will have the same interest in discovering and truth and science and moving forward at a time they didn't they couldn't and remember especially that that the church was very very powerful in the continent in england it was already um uh, separated because henry we know henry the eighth uh, separated the the church from from rome so we find that great great people of that time like Da Vinci, you know, Da Vinci was not just a painter. Da Vinci was an engineer, a kind of maker, a builder. He had an incredible mind. He was really the universal man. Da Vinci was uh, a mason. Galileo, as we say, he was a mason. Peter the Great, another mason adventure, another mind who interest on, was interested in everything that was happening. He was so interested in everything that was happening that he felt that he had to build the city closer to Europe, to be closer to everything that was happening at the time. And he created St. Petersburg. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, Mozart, Beethoven, Cristobal Colón, you know, Columbus, the one that kind of by mistake, discovered the Americas, but he was of the belief that the world was not flat, but round. Lafayette, uh, who fought for, for the independence of the Americas and France. So we got all these incredible brains of the time involved uh, in, in, in the, a huge movement. And they all found that within the guilds, it's hiding within the, the Mason guilds, uh, they could communicate with each, other, with each other. They could exchange ideas that they couldn't do outside because in those days it was anathema, it was prohibited, right? So 
the guild changed. It was no more about building uh, churches and, 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 and palaces, but about building knowledge, about building this great new move that was going to kind of shake the world, the age of enlightenment. So um, we get that these men who were, into, who were interested in science and in discoveries, they were equally interested in questions of morality, especially how to build moral, moral character. Out of the new focus grew what we call now speculative, speculative Freemasonry, as opposite to operative Freemasonry. Today, all Freemasonry is speculative, which began in the 17th century, and the Lodges Star became meeting places for men dedicated to and associated with liberal Western values. Okay, but remember, we are talking about the 17th century, so liberal Western values were not seen very well by not only the church, but for, by a lot of, of the monarchs of the time. Of course, people like Peter the Great and all that were rare monarchs who were interested in that. So they had to still remain um, secret and operate underground. But that is going to change, uh, like everything, as the movements started, the, the world started, Europe, Europe especially started opening up. And let's, uh, we're going to go into the next stage, but let's find out who brought Freemasonry to England. Well, we all know about King James VI of Scotland, who was King James I of England. He was the successor of Elizabeth because she didn't have issue. King James was the one who authorized the version of the Holy Bible in plain language. That in itself was revolutionary, right? If suddenly the Bible was going to be available for everyone who could read the, the language of the country, obviously it was English at the time. So, and we know that he was a Freemason. In fact, there are records in the Lodge of Schoon in Paris, in Paris where uh, say that in December, Christmas of 1658, King James was uh, adopted as an enter apprentice. It's very interesting to see that he was the king, but he had to go the, the process that any other Freemason has to go, enter apprentice, fellow craft, master mason. So, by the time he comes to England to take the throne from Elizabeth, he is already a master mason, right? And uh, so suddenly, um, while it was still underground, people knew that he was a master mason. And a lot of aristocrats and people in the court wanted to join Freemasonry. Not necessarily for the right reasons, but well, if my king is Freemason, probably it will be very good for me to be a Freemason too. So um, Freemasonry, came from Scotland to England. But as we know, the Stuarts the Stuart didn't do well in England at all. And so by the time of King James II, uh, he had to run, he had to um, leave the throne, and he found refuge in France. All of the Scots uh, were very linked to France. As we know, Mary, Queen of Scots, she being uh, married to the King of France. He died very young, so she stopped being a Queen of France very quickly and went back to, to Scotland. But they've only been a big link with the, um, with the Scots and, and France. So the Stuarts moved to France, and there, when he goes in exile, he brings Freemasonry with him back to France and they found the Grand Orient of France. That will be the Grand Orient of Freemasonry in France. So now we have Freemasonry in England and we got Freemasonry on the continent because from France, it starts moving around another part of the continent. So in 1717, um, the Grand Lodge of England was created. Uh, Freemasonry comes out of the cover, shall we call it. And, um, and it was a very, very important, uh, took quite a lot of courage at the time. Uh, and a lot of the people who were Freemasons, they, they were quite powerful, but nevertheless, they came out. And it's very interesting because um, in the day of St. John the Baptist, um, which is a very uh, protective figure uh, in Freemasonry, and the four existing lodges gathered at the Goose and Giridon Ale House in London and constitute themselves a Grand Lodge. 
the four lodges had previously met together in 1716 at the Apple Tree Cavern. Tavern. And that's what is so interesting. They didn't have the temple, the, the, the master, the Freemason temples that we know today. No, they used to rent one or two rooms in a tavern and make sure that it was a secret and it was well uh, guarded. But well, in Freemason, you have an outer guard and an inner guard for that purpose. And, uh, and they will write the signs, so all the things that we have now hanging at the back and all that, the symbols of Freemasonry, they will be drawn with chalk on the floor because that way uh, they could erase it and nobody will have a record that, that they were Freemasons and they have been there, you know. And in fact, it was interesting because one um, uh, one of the Freemasons um, was uh, visiting uh, one of the, um, what they call the pioneer lodges, you know, the very young lodges in places like, like Russia or Germany where they were prohibited. And that people don't have temples yet. So they just carry the things around and they meet in the room or whatever, or one of the members or whatever, create the lodge, have the meeting, and then uncreate the lodge, you know. And that's the way it was in the early days of Freemasonry. Uh, the basic principles of the Grand Lodge of England were inspired in, by the idea of tolerance, a universal understanding of the enlightenment, and by the scientific method and rationalism of the 17th century. It was momentous, totally momentous. Okay, they come out of the closet. But, <laughs> uh, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Let me just, I have a little problem here. Please be patient. Um, we'll go here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. The early Masonic lodges were exclusively male, meaning that women were prohibited from membership. A point made very clear on the old charges. No bondmen, no women, no immoral or scandalous men. So obviously women were also on the same level with moral and scandalous men. This tradition was a principle that reflected the predominant social arrangements of the time and continue for many decades, especially in Great Britain. In fact, in Great Britain, it still exists, and that have filtered to the colonies, you know, like, let's say, the United States, Australia, and South Africa. Uh, when, when they colonized those countries, the Grand Lodge of England was the ruling uh, Masonic body, and those rules went into the, the countries too. Uh, but uh, this was the end of the 1700s, and a lot of things are, go are going to be shaking the world, the old world of the times. And that, that was the French Revolution. You know that the French Revolution was going to have tremendous uh, consequences in the continent, definitely, in a way, also in England, and definitely in the Americas. So one of the principles of the French Revolution was equality. We're talking about equality. And that was won by very hard work by the women of the French Revolution. They were in the front line as much as the men. In fact, it were the women of the French Revolution who marched onto Versailles to bring back the king. So we find that from 1893 to 1899, France saw the formation of the first mixed international mainstream Masonic order or obligation. And that mix uh, uh, lodge became international and it is called the old mixed international du droit humain, you know, the right of the human being. Adopted the Scottish right and these days exist in more than 60 countries around the world and it's probably one of the few Freemason orders that is growing. So 1893 to 1899 was also a very important time, not only for France, but for the world. Uh, the suffragette uh, movement, women start asking for their right. Of course, in, in France already they had it, but it started happening all over the world. And obviously it makes sense the women should also be part of Freemason as they were part of everything else. Um, I say that 
female, French female song. It has long attempted to include women. But the grand tourists in France are allowed return of adoption. You know, you, you could adopt sisters, wife and daughters, etc. But it's only in 79 when the lodge called the Free Sinkers reserved and is charted the right to initiate women as Freemasons, proclaiming the essential equality of men and women. Marie de Rasmus was the first one, Elizabeth Adward, were very much uh, at the front of it. And as you can see, there is an old photograph there in the corner, that's from the 18, end of the 1800s, of a mixed lodge. And the lodges carry on are, are still mixed all over the world. Um, as, uh, we know that in America, we got uh, lodges for women only. And in England, we got lodges for men only. And in some others, like in South Africa, you also have that. But the, the mixed order of men and women, let the right to men, exists in many places. And for instance, at this moment, the Grand Master of the Lodge of Catan is a woman. Right. And I think that is terribly important. It's not about fighting between each other is rather about working together. So um, let me just explain this. Uh, something that was going to become also very important. Now, we got women and Freemasonry. But in 1817, uh, France opened a secular schools. I mean, a schools where no religion will be taught. And that put them, of course, in direct conflict with the Catholic Church. So the French Orient decided to remove the need of a belief in God. Of course, it was not accepted by all the lodges. Uh, each lodge was allowed to follow its own beliefs. But it's not that they say that they didn't believe in God. It's say that to be a Freemason, you didn't necessarily have to believe in God. And of course, most, most important, that people of any religion can become Freemasons. Right. Your God is as good as my God. And if you've got a problem to, relieve, uh, to believe in God, well, that is your personal choice, your freedom of conscience. Uh, so many of those lodges talk about the great architect of the universe. Whoever you think the great architect universe is, could have been God, could be Allah, could be, or could be, you know, a scientist will say, no, there is no creation as such. The world, by one sentient being, but if the world was created by the Big Bang, by the great explosion, of energy, whatever, but there is there is a principle of creation of the universe, and that is what the lodges were for. But of course, if any individual within the lodge believes in God, and when they say, who do you put your faith in, say, God, it's perfectly admitted. It's just that if you, if you don't believe in that, you still got a right to be a Freemason and to work for the betterment of yourself and humanity. But of course, all this is going to become, is very revolutionary, but I would, that was part of the whole movement that that is happening in the world. And the one thing that is has not changed is symbols and allegory. Freemasonry works very much uh, with stories, allegories, and the symbols are tremendously important because it reminds us of the things, the virtues, and the obligation. And I'm going to just show you a few of the more common ones. I'm sure that you have seen most of them. In fact, most of the um, lodges, Freemason lodges, have them outside and in the front. And there is nothing terribly secret about it because uh, we are very proud of that. And they the are a guide for a Freemason to act in a certain way. So... Uh, the principal tenets of Freemasonry are brotherly love, relief, I mean help to the others, to the brothers, and also help to the society at large. Truth, right? So from these tenets come the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, the old faith, and they are supported on the three great pillars of wisdom. That is something that you're going to find in every lodge, the pillars of wisdom, strength, and beauty which is expressed by the symbols, right? So you see a, a string here on, on, on the, further, uh, the further end, wisdom in the middle, which will be the pillar of the master, the right worshipful master, and beauty on the other side. So we believe that those are the pillars uh, that keep humanity. So 
those symbols, they are much more than the Jacob's Ladder because it's a progression to get to be a better self. And there are, there are many more. It's just a, a part of being a Mason is to learn that and to follow uh, those different disciplines. So probably the more common one that you have seen is the old CNI, because I mean, for God's sake, it's even in the dollar bill. And um, it's from 1797, um, it's been, it was introduced in the publication of Freemason Monitor. Again, it came out of the closet, but it's actually a progression of the eye of Horus, the old CNI. It represents the eye of God and serves as a reminder to Freemason that God is always watching, seeing all of the actions and thought. And even if you don't believe in God, that you yourself, deep in your soul, you know what you are doing. And you must listen and pay attention to that. The old seeing eye actually is within yourself. Don't lie to yourself, because deep down, your heart see what you're doing. Um, the other one, probably the the most common that everybody has seen everywhere is that, which is the letter, the letter G with a compass in the square. Okay, um, a lot of people think that the letter G stands for God. Obviously, that is not the case. If you want to, but uh, this is a very old symbol. And as you know, the word God is only in English. So if anything, it would have been probably in Latin or whatever, which would be a D for Deus. But the little the letter G stands for geometry, which is and the principles of geometry and mathematics rule the function of the universe. And all the others believe it represents the word gnosis, and very much so. Gnosis means knowledge, is the old Greek term for knowledge. And, and in this case will be knowledge of the spiritual mysteries, which is a big component of mastery, uh, of masonry. So if there, is, if there are some secrets, and masonry, it is exactly that, the spiritual mysteries to, about improving yourself. Um, also, the letter G in, in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, had a numerical value of three, which through history represent the sacred trilogy. It's a very, very important symbol, again, mystical symbol. Um, the meaning of the square world, that's quite literal. Um, they represent morality and the Freemasons need to square the actions by the square of virtue with all my, mankind. You know, I think we use it in regular and come on, it's very square, it's very right. You do things on the square. You are doing it properly. And, and the compass measures the ability to conduct actions within certain boundaries. In other words, together the square and the campus reminds Freemason to explore their desires and passions and all they want to do. But while doing that, may act on the square to the rest of the people and remember what are your boundaries, that your freedom stops when start the freedom of the other one, that you have to respect the needs of the other ones too and humanity. And so, the other one that is terribly important is the Masonic place in a star that is always in every lodge behind the door of the Right Worshipful Master, which is the pinnacle of uh, Freemason January. And Freemasonry, a man tries to use knowledge to guide them to a better life. And the star blazing against the dark sky is a symbol of following the dream of that that you want to become to do, to be part of. The star will light your journey. It's a symbol. All right, now um, we're not gonna bother you too much more. I just want to explain because you probably heard about it. Um, in the English Lodge, they only have three, uh, three degrees, which is enter, apprentice, uh, fellow craft, and master mason. Um, once an individual becomes a master mason, it can be elected to be an officer. There are different officers uh, within the lodge. And eventually the pinnacle of all, the higher of all the offers of the career will be to become the right worshipful master of the lodge. Um, but in the continental Freemasonry, it follows the, um, uh, the Scottish rite. There are many more degrees after um, master Freemason. Um, in fact, there are 33 degrees 
And the last one, obviously, will be the normally is the one who becomes um, the one who, man who directs the federation. Um, but each degree got a different meaning. Um, they will work on a different virtue. And when uh, a mason achieved that degree, will be, for instance, in the 18th degree, the, the message is love. So it's about then you will work very hard at realizing are you loving properly? yourself? Are you loving proper your fellow men? Are you loving proper humanity? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? So there are all different virtues and the different degrees. And, and the a mason through its career uh, will be moving through all those steps and working through all those steps within himself because the goal is actually to build the perfect temple. And the perfect temple should be yourself. Okay, now I think we all have heard about that, and we all know everything that has ever happened and um, about conspiracies. We hear all kinds of things, you know, the Freemasons are involved and, and the governments and they are managing the governments. They make all the different presidents and kings and all that into puppets to follow their own. Um, horrible goals, um, the allegations that they, they get involved, especially uh, in religious things, uh, for instance, that they, they got anti-Christian satanic beliefs and practices that they get together to, um, you know, and the, to follow, to venerate the devil and they sacrifice children to them and they do all kinds of things. Very interesting because that is exactly the same that they were saying about the Templars. The Templars were burned at the stake for those allegations. So now those allegations have been put onto, onto um, uh, the Freemasons. They also say that they do all kind of, they are involved in all kind of occult processes, that they try to influence the media uh, for their own purposes, etc., uh, etc. Well, that's only happened with secret societies. Um, when we see some of the things that we can read, them, it's quite, it's quite, um, uh, quite funny because they give Freemasons much more power than, than they really have. And um, and the fascinating thing is that the Freemasons have never stood up to uh, negate those things. It's just like kind of. This is who we are. This is what we are doing. We put our energy working for this and that and whatever for the humanity, working for ourselves, taking care of each other, taking care of our uh, neighborhood, of our friends, or whatever. And they never come out to oppose any of the things they are said. It's just kind of, well, you can say whatever you want. We are not going to get into an argument about it. So, of course, there are all kinds of conspiracies, uh, theories, and things like that. And there will probably be, you know, until another bigger and more powerful organization comes out there. By the way, um, the Freemasons got nothing to do with the Illuminati. That, that's another thing that is out there, say. Right. Um, and um, all the stories about worship. It doesn't make any sense because the Freemasons are not a religion. They don't worship. They don't worship any God whatsoever. What a Freemason does personally when he goes to church or whatever, that is, he does it as an individual, not as a Freemason. But um, the, well, Freemason, as I say, is not a religion. All its members believe in a supreme being or a grand architect of the universe. But there is one religion in particular. Who bars, uh, who bars any crossover, which means the Catholic Church first condemned Freemasonry in 1738 and until 1983 had excommunicated any Catholics who become a Freemason. Of course, many Catholics have become Freemason without telling the Church. Uh, but until 83, um, it was the, um, the risk of excommunication. Um, before, of course, they were burned at the stake. And, um, and the Vatican even called the Masons the synagogue of Satan. Um, at present, it is still considered a mortal sin. But um, Freemasonry had no problem with Catholics. Um, we know the Catholics, we actually are Freemasons. Uh, we definitely will accept it. It's 
up to them and their conscious how they do it. We don't, uh, there is no problem whatsoever with other religions. If other religions have problem with that, well, yes, uh, but um, there is not a problem with religion because it's not a religion at all. Right, so besides the Vatican, they have been another very, very serious enemy to Freemasons, and it's something that is very seldom talk about, and of course, the Freemasons don't go around publishing it. And that's what happened with the Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, German uh, wartime propaganda charge that the Jews and Masons have provo provoked the World War II, right? And, uh, and especially the Freemasons, because um, Delano Roosevelt, uh, the president of the U.S. at the time, uh, he was a Freemason. So as I say that the Freemasons in Germany were plotting together with Roosevelt in America to, um, to bring down the Nazi regime. The interesting thing is the the Americans didn't get into the war until uh, much later with the when it was the attack in Hawaii. So uh, it didn't make any sense because um, the Nazis started putting uh, um, Freemasons in prison from about 37, 38, and not only in prison. They later on they put them in the in the concentration camps. Yes, most people don't. And the fate of the Freemasons, to say, in nesting labor and extermination camps, is largely unknown. Um, the Nazis um, shut, uh, got into the, the lodges, destroyed, burned, and tear entire Masonic libraries and nationalized precious objects and art collection belonging to their members. They held the Freemasons into camp and forced them to wear, where you can see there, a red patch in the shape of an upside down triangle. The, as you know, the shoes were wearing a yellow, um, a yellow star. The Freemason had to wear a red triangle. Why? Because the triangle, the other way around, was a symbol of Freemasonry. So they felt that making the triangle with the with the vertex to the to the bottom, would have taken the power away from them. And reality was, you know, it didn't make any sense. But the important thing is that many of the Freemasons who were at risk were also Jews or members of the political oppositions. So we don't know exactly how many were placed in Nazi concentration camps because, not just because they were Freemasons, but because they belonged to any of the other groups. And as we know, Freemasonry was about for freedom, for equality, for um, respect for the human, the humans, exactly. So a lot of Freemasons were part of the resistance groups in France and Europe and all everywhere. And they, many of them were killed or whatever, but they were not a part of the resistance because Freemasonry told them you have to be a part of the resistance fighting against this government or against Hitler or against Mussolini. It's because they were Freemasons with those principles that they became part of the resistance movements, you know. And that is what is many times was the misconstructed or misunderstood. I mean, because the Freemasons believe in freedom, they were part of the French Revolution. They were part of the American Revolution. And South America, you know, Bolivar was also a, free, a Freemason. So um, it's not that Freemasonry told anyone, anyone what to do. That is not what Freemasonry is about at all. It's about support of the other, it's about support of humanity. It's coming to help when a brother is bad, but sometimes it's in bad, it's in bad uh, health or financial uh, state. But it's more than that. It's about working for the improvement of humanity. And, and of course, sometimes they will be involved in freedom uh, movements or other things that were fighting for injustice. Uh, there were many Freemasons here, which of course were involved in the armed anti-apartheid movements. Remember the point of Freemasonry in South Africa came in the early days of the colonization. And of course it was um, uh, uh, the Lodge of England that it was followed. Um, then in 1915, 
the Le Droit Humain, which is the one that is uh, co-freemasonry for men and women, started in Durban in 1915, and now it is in four, well, it's been for a long time in four cities in South Africa. So, of course, there were Freemasons involved in those movements because of who they were and who they believed and fighting for um, fairness. But that doesn't mean that Freemasonry told them to get involved in politics. Uh, in fact, it's one of the things uh, that what is in, in Freemason, you don't discuss politics or religion. That is something to be held by the individual, and he has his freedom and his right to be silent about it. So we know that being a Mason is a way of life, of morality, integrity, help, and truth. It's not a sect. It's not a religion. It's a group of people working together, trying to support each other, trying to make this world a little bit, sometimes through their example and sometimes materially and physically, uh, making it a little bit of a better place for themselves, working through humanity. Uh, I'm going to be taking any questions now. Thank you. Victoria? Thanks, Liliana. That was very informative. I thought I knew a, a lot about Freemasonry, particularly in Scotland, but I've learned an awful lot today. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure how many people know that you used to be uh, burnt at the stake for translating uh, the Bible from Ooh. Latin into into English. I know Thomas Harding. It was the um, local to where I went to school, and uh, yeah, he was he was burnt at the stake for for that. So yeah, yeah. until James the Sixth of Scotland. Um, yeah, things are very different. But um, yes, I'll open it up to the gallery. Does anybody want to um, ask any questions? Question? Put the hand up and I will gladly answer. It's me, Liliana. Yes, yes. Okay, talk. I just want to know. So um, it makes sense that the, um, that the Egyptians uh, knew about geometry and things like that, because just by the pyramids. So it's unfortunate that a lot of that has been lost. Definitely. Why, why, would, why would it have been lost? I mean, you well, wrote things down. So you think that they may have written how they did it. Well, that is very interesting that you say that. Yes. Um, some of the form, you remember, uh, only the last... 100 years or 150 years that we have discovered a lot of those tombs and all that. And it's much that it, that we don't have. And, uh, and it's much that is only been, um, how we call it, um, understood now or the formulas in, uh, that existed. In fact, it was just an article that somebody who was actually a mathematician looking at some records of something that it was found about a hundred years ago, it was written, and they just thought these were records because this person knew mathematics. I said, no, no, this is actually the Pythagoras theorem, right? But what happened? A lot of the people who translate these uh, hieroglyphics, because that's what it was at the time, time, um, are scholars with a certain knowledge, more humanistic knowledge. When they saw that, they didn't understand. They said, well, this is some names or names of someone that we don't understand, and it was left. And now this guy, um, as I say, said, no, this is the Pythagoras theorem, which will give the basis, you know, the base of equilateral. So if you want to build in a triangle, they sh you should have a certain base to have the support. You know, the later will teach how to create those very high churches will not collapse, all that. So I think it's not that necessarily all that disappear is that we, we haven't managed to understand everything that we have found. And I'm sure there's a lot of hidden manuscripts in a lot of the universities or the Vatican that they don't even know they're there, you know? Exactly. Know the Vatican's going slowly through all their manuscripts will take them another 3,000 years, but it's slowly because there's apparently stuff that's been there hundreds and hundreds of years. They don't know what it is. 
but that's exactly what happened. And imagine if it was some of, we know the stuff was taken away from the Alexandria uh, library before it was burned. We know a lot of stuff was looted before. And we know a lot end up in the Vatican, which look, it makes sense. It was, they had the, the possibilities to keep it safe and to keep it away from the destruction because it was burned. So it was good, but they were put around there. Now, who gets there to investigate? And the Vatican, unfortunately, doesn't let people outside the Vatican to go into those secret archives. So are they even getting into all those secret archives? We don't know. And do they have the knowledge to understand what they are reading? That is also a problem. Eh? Exactly. That is very yes, much The church has a lot to uh, answer for. <laughs> well... Yeah, no. Uh, as a, as a Catholic, as a Catholic. We, try, we try to move forward. We try to move forward. And I believe that this Pope is trying to move forward. Yes. You know, the church, we also must represent, we are not talking, uh, we're talking about the church, we talk about the religion. You know, not necessarily the people who were in charge of such a big power as the church was. Uh, we cannot judge the religion because of the people who was in power. Was the they've just found at Sakira, they've just found another tomb intact. Yeah. So who knows what they're going to find one of these days. They may find something. Uh, let's hope so. I hope but in my lifetime, in my lifetime, that they found people from space. I <laughs> Well, uh, we well we haven't found the written records. Uh, we have to say we seen some of those things in the high collet and the carvings, and the, in the fact of the way that the bill tells us that they understood it. Mm. Well, I uh, just thank you, girls, and uh, I hope that this has been. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Charles and uh, Claudia. And um, I hope that this uh, brought you a little bit uh, clarification of a subject that for me is very dear, of course. <laughs> thank you, Molly. And, uh, and that we understand a little bit more what, what it's about. And um, this is uh, not making propaganda because <laughs> the Freemason, by the way, don't proselytize. They don't try to convert anyone to be Freemason, rather the opposite you have to uh, contact them and there will be a couple of interviews and there's going to be a voting and etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, but um, I'm just glad that we understand a little bit more what it is and, and where we're going thank you very much and I'll leave you now